people that are in the Western world and specifically the United States, what they're realizing, whether they can say it this way or not, is you're watching the end of an empire. I've said this for a long time, and it's not the empire is going to collapse. The empire is collapsing right now. We are in the midst of, and people say economic collapse, it's empire collapse, which means economic is part of it. What is up, guys? Welcome back to Bitcoin Audible. I am Guy Swan, the guy who has read more about Bitcoin than anybody else you know. The show is brought to you by Swan Bitcoin and CoinKite. Swan is where you're going to buy, where you're going to buy Bitcoin, where you're going to plug your life into Bitcoin, where you're going to learn about Bitcoin. And the cold card hardware wallet from CoinKite is where you are going to put your Bitcoin to keep it safe. They've both been longtime supporters of this show and they bring this to you. And they also have amazing products and services. So definitely check them out if you haven't. Now, today, we talk a lot about the coming financial crisis. Well, the, the financial crisis we are in the midst of, the banking crisis that is starting to ramp back up. We just talked about it with Preston Pish. But one thing that I realize I get a lot of questions about and I don't talk a lot about because there's not really one good answer for it. It's a pretty broad topic is what do you do? How do you protect yourself during a banking crisis? Honestly, how do you survive a massive global monetary shift away from fiat back to better money? And so that's why I have my good friend and like legendary podcaster Jack Spirico on the show with us today. Uh, If you don't know Jack, he does the survival podcast. I've been on with him a couple of times. I think he's been on here on Bitcoin Audible once maybe. I'm not even sure, but he's, uh, I consider him a good friend and uh, also incredibly knowledgeable about self-sufficiency, about survival, about how to make sure, like how to think about, there's a, there's a lot of kind of like canned things that people say, oh, do this and do that. And it's amazing how much bad advice are in kind of the normal things that people think they should do, you know, when there's a crisis or when there's a supply shock or when just the general availability and reliability of the normal system, so to speak, the grocery store comes into question. And money obviously is a hugely important topic around that. And this might need to be two parts um, because we actually had to stop short. So we might actually continue this and that'll be a really good option to, or a really good opportunity to get your feedback, to see like what questions were you hoping were asked? What questions did you want to ask him that we didn't get to cover uh, so that we can do this when we bring him back on the show? So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into this uh, really, really fantastic conversation with Jack from the Survival Podcast. Jack, thank you so much for coming to the show. This has been kind of a fun little like game of tug of war with the internet and our schedules and everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, I'm I am seriously jazzed about getting in this, and I think the anticipation is building. It's getting a lot worse. <laughs> so uh, uh, let's get right into it for the second time. Uh, well, thank we you had for to, coming to the we, show. Yeah. We had to schedule it three times, and then we had to try three times to actually do it. So that's there you go. There you go. Three squared. <laughs> Dude, uh, for the audience, uh, why don't you uh, give that introduction again? Because I think it's important that they hear it. And for anybody who doesn't know who Jack is, uh, you're missing out. You're missing out. You're about to hear. Thanks for having me, man. I am the host of the Survival Podcast. We've been running almost 16 years since June of uh, 2008. We've done 3,460 odd episodes as of today. Uh, we've won podcast. I still can't with that shit. I still can't. That's ridiculous. <laughs> podcast of year twice. We beat Adam Curry in the general category, and the awards now carry his name. That's a pretty good feather in the cap, I guess. But we focus on self reliance, self sufficiency, indiv- individual liberty, uh, and personal responsibility. God, sixteen years, man. 
Dude, when That's I started, I would like I would be listening to other podcasts and all to kind of get a feel for it. And I would have like mm -hmm. an iPod, an iPod, like a brick iPod, and be like at a store paying or something, have like one earbud in, and people are like, What are you listening to? You know, thinking you're listening to music, you're like podcasts. You had to tell them what a podcast was. They, people <laughs> didn't know. I'd say one in ten people even knew what a podcast was when I started. That's so neat. That's so crazy. It's gonna be it's it's gonna be funny with Bitcoin in that like in fact it's it, it's interesting like bitcoin has already kind of infected the general population yeah. so to speak like it's it's in it's within the overton window of yes this exists and we know about it sort of thing the genesis block in in my show are not that far apart in time right like it was i think oh nine june that's right yeah that's so it was cool. very was beginning january old. yeah wow yeah i wish i had the money that people think i do when i say what i'm about to say next i've been uh, stacking Bitcoin since 2013. So, so you would think I'm sitting on like enough to own a place called Jackistan or something, but like many people, were, right? Yeah. Or I also call it fuck off a stand, right? Like yeah. that's my dream someday. And, and I have a pretty nice stack, but when I look back and think of all the Bitcoin that I blew, uh, both in my forays for a time into shit coining and then just you know, I, I, was a, I was a Coinbase affiliate when it was probably the best place to buy Bitcoin that long ago. And I remember getting 0 0.01 Bitcoin for every referral. So when you when you earn money that way, then, you know, like when Bitcoin was 660 bucks, mm -hmm. I was at a barter thing and a dude had this gorgeous pre-World War II Browning Belgian A5 shotgun. And it was probably worth about eighteen hundred to two thousand dollars mm -hmm. and bitcoins were six hundred and some bucks and i'm like i'll give you one bitcoin i'll set you up with a wallet and i'll teach you how to use it he's like done i'm like score i just bought it for a third of what it's worth so now mm. i have a seventy thousand dollar shotgun worth two grand <laughs> right i mean like there, there, there and, and the reason i you know even got into it people wonder like in preparedness like aren't you guys all like you know like I don't know, making phone calls with a potato in a ditch or something and, and, and land nabbing <laughs> with a compass. No, we're, you know, we're lifestyle design and preparedness is a component of that. And money's like really important. I don't know if you've noticed. And so it is a little as bit. I reformed my shit coining ways and realized Bitcoin was more than just a thing, you know, I realized probably about 2016, 2017, it was the hardest form of money known to man. And then it did take me a couple more years to finally swear off you know, all of the other options. I was never yeah. big into like yeah. every other coin, but I, I really thought there were other use cases. And we, we, I've been on before with you and you've been on with me. And so, you know, that when lightning really started to show what it was going to be, I'm like, okay, it's over. There's no, there's nothing left. There's now that we're building on Bitcoin, then any application that's actually an application, we'll figure out how to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It just makes it clear that the, the stack is built on top, like the base protocol is the monetary assurances. Yeah. And when you realize, when, when you realize that what they're trying to do is they're trying to create a base protocol with high level features with, you know, layer three features essentially. Mm -hmm. And they're essentially putting the cart before the horse. They're thinking that you need those features in the monetary rule set fundamentally. And they're failing to realize that this is literally in the service layer of the thing it's like it's like you know building some particular or writing some particular book in comparison to the english language like categorical error in yeah. what you're trying to yeah. target um yeah actually the book writing dude that's a great analogy because think of it this way like if you're going to create a language you create an alphabet let's say the mm -hmm. 26 character uh alphabet that we use and then you develop rules of language and now you can make words well, if you try mm -hmm. to write the book before the alphabet, everything's going to get screwed up. But even if you get it all right, your book ends up being a book nobody wants. Yeah. If you, make, <laughs> yeah. you make the al alphabet and various authors will write books and the winning books will get purchased and read and used and shared. And mm -hmm. so if you think of Bitcoin that way, you make the fundamental monetary base layer. And because yeah. most of these shit coins, it's clear why they're doing it, right? It's They're doing it because they have to sell people on their stupid ass idea. Yeah. So they'll do something like they get to print money if they get to prove that they, yeah. if they get people excited or hyped about their money.
you know. But they have to give you a reason. Why are you making mm -hmm. this new money? Well, so let's say Volt coin, it's for the electrical industry, and they'll pull some yeah. number out of thin air that's actually real. Like, you know, the, the market is a $3.2 trillion market. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. Sure it is, but it doesn't it doesn't mean they want your shit. They yeah. gotta give people a reason to buy it. And you know, you know the drill, you've been around long enough. They yeah. pump it up, they get it on some exchanges, they paid themselves 20 billion volt coins or shit coin or whatever it is. And then they cash out and they do it again. And, you know, I, the, the, the big op applications I saw as being potentially useful were like privacy and, and we're, we're going to get there with Bitcoin. And so, mm -hmm. you know, everything else was just paint. Yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting too the way, the way it's framed just in the kind of general context of like, there's going to be a money for energy and there's going to be a money for, houses and there's going to be a money like because inevitably you're talking about a digital token that can only have monetary premium that's yeah. the only thing it can have because it is literally intangible so the only yeah. thing it's going to carry around with it is monetary premium pure and simple doesn't and, it sound stupid when you say it that way a money for houses a yeah. money for electricity a money for point. cannabis right like yeah. it's just the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard a money for porn like <laughs> And you think There's about like it too, like to my understanding, it's fundamentally like anti-monetary theory, like like anti yeah. the purpose, the raison d'etre of money itself is to not have to barter. And yeah. now, what I'm like, you know, when they say something like it's a three point two trillion dollar market for energy production or whatever the hell it is, you're immediately asking, it's like, okay, so you want to be a middleman between yeah. me and my energy, like by creating a whole nother token and you're just going to swallow up all of the, like the whole point of money is to be an independent medium to compare things against ha trying to have some illiquid market, like this crazy illiquid and fluctuating market with all individual pricing mechanisms. Now we need a central pricing mechanism for the horse token and the teeth token <laughs> and the car token, because wasn't that the point of having a money to begin with is so that you you could have a liquid yeah. market between the money and yeah. everything. But anyway, Jesus Christ. Yeah, well, um, no, you know, so like if you have to go back to early trading is like so I have, I'm like a part of a hunter clan, mm -hmm. right? And you're part of a farming clan. And we come across each other in our travels and I have this big sack of dried meat and you have this big sack of corn and we come to this agreement on exchanging it. But then we re like, I'm like, dude, I don't, I'm anti-vegan. I, I have all the meat I want and I'll <laughs> give you some meat. But there's nothing you like. I don't want your corn. So you're like, well, I have an obsidian knife. And eventually, like, the obsidian knife becomes the currency because it's durable and it has utility no matter who has it. And eventually, we came up with better monies than that. Right. Mm -hmm. So this was the reverse. Like, you're like going into worse and worse forms of money. So, like, I have beef jerky coin and, and you have <laughs> corn coin, which I'm sure both of those exist, by the way. And if they don't, they probably they do. will in this altcoin shit cycle. And so yeah. now we have to come up with an intermediary between our two. It, it's dumb. Yeah. It's so stupid. And when you, like I said, when you say it that way, like we have one money for housing and one money for electricity, like all of a sudden it just sounds as dumb as it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's, that was always a, a fascinating part for, and you know, there's still a ton of new people. Um, coming yeah. in, so it can't be it can't be repeated often enough to to try to make it make sense because yeah. it's so easy I, I to get real confused me. in the crypto world. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> but uh, I wanted to have you on the show specifically okay. because, uh, uh, as I as we were talking about before this, is I've had a lot of people come on the show and I've had tons and tons of conversations in trying to analyze and break down why there is going to be a collapse why there is going to be a massive shift that's happening and all the ins and outs and theories and philosophy behind that. But one thing that I do not talk about very much and I get a lot of questions about too, is what the hell do you do during and after? Or I guess, what is it going to be like during and after and what do I need to do to protect myself leading into that aside from just understanding that it's going to happen? And I just recently, this was just so kind of, epic and very prescient, I guess is the word, um, mm -hmm. of a post that I saw and somebody reposted it on Reddit and said, man, I have never heard anybody put this 
so clearly. And they even made a comment that it's like one of those things that you're not even aware of until you hear it spoken. And then you realize it's been sitting on your, it's been weighing on your chest for a long time. And this was the post that, the, that he was referencing. It says, I am 57. Not only does it feel like something wicked this way comes, but there is also this feeling that the whole world is holding its breath, almost as though we are all waiting for some catalyst or sign or event that puts an end to this feeling of being put on hold. This vague, unexplained unease that we feel. Something terrible lurking just out of our field of vision, but we all feel it closing in. I cannot count the number of people who have told me that they wish that whatever is going to happen would just get on with it. That this waiting for the thing in the darkness is unbearable. And I wanted to, I wanted to hand that over to you sure. and start this conversation with that frame. That's a great idea. And it is where we're at right now. And it, it's not just Bitcoiners, but every big name Bitcoiner I get on my show, like there's the after conversation. Mm -hmm. And it's every big name, any, anybody with any like horsepower financially, even if they're not into Bitcoin, it seems like they're feeling this way right now. There's a fear of loss because they have something to lose. Yeah. And almost every one of those guys, I'm working with some other people and we're going to get some land. We're all going to get <laughs> together and we're going to move in and we're going to, you know, they start talking about all the stuff they're going to do. And you're like, let's just like with the shit coin, let's not put the cart in front of the horse. What's happening to people right now is this will sound a little bit of a divergence, but it's the key to the success of horror writers like Stephen King. Stephen King was one time asked, what makes you so successful as an author? And he said, when you were a little kid, you laid in your bed at night and you were terrified of what was underneath it. But if somebody asked you exactly what it was, you didn't know what it was. Your mind was able to conjure up so many possibilities that it was more terrifying than actually looking a monster in the eye. I don't show you the monster. What I do is I make you feel that way. I write about the thing you were afraid of under the bed, but I don't really show you what it is. So your own mind makes you more fearful than you would be otherwise. This is what we're facing. We are in a place and, you know, people that are in the Western world and specifically the United States, what they're realizing, whether they can say it this way or not, is you're watching the end of an empire. Yeah. I said this for a long time and it's not the empire is going to collapse. The empire is collapsing right now. Yeah. You're and in the empire. Watching. If you're like a, like a sci-fi fan, you've probably seen like a Star Trek episode or something where like they're, they're, they're cruising along and they think they're still going where they're supposed to. And they're like, there's a ship over there and they can't get to it. And it's really a reflection of them. They already went into the black hole. They're inside the event horizon and they're circling mm -hmm. it, but they think they're still on course and it takes them a while to figure it out. That's what you're experiencing when people feel that way right now. We are in the midst of, and people say economic collapse, it's empire collapse, which means economic is part of it, right? Yeah. Um, and it's all economic one and political. And I think a large part of the reason is because our economic has been driven by political foundations. Correct. Like the money which, is a permissive device. Like, like it only exists because of political authority. Which if you crack history books for more than five seconds and you combine that with something called pattern recognition, which we te teach in the space of permaculture and regenerative agriculture, it's really obvious where we are. If yeah. you look at every empire that ever existed, they all did similar things. They debased their currency. They built their entire civilization on annual agriculture denuded fields were unable to feed themselves and as their money devalued and their resources devalued simultaneously in order to keep control instead of saying hey look guys we have a problem let's fix it they started shouting about people that were over there and and starting wars and then convincing the people that all their problems would go away if they just saw to these wars and the apparatus of power sought more to stay in power than to fix the problems and you can play that game for so long. So what comes next is further monetary debasement. And eventually that results in an empire, you know, best case scenario splits in two like the Roman Empire did and hangs on for a couple more centuries. But mm -hmm. we live in a society where you don't get to hang on for a couple more centuries. Things move much faster in an age where everything is digital and everybody knows what's going on. And so even the people that have been true believers that really if my side was in control, we'd be okay are starting to realize as they look out across the horizon, like there's no way to fix this. So mm -hmm. once you know there's no way to fix this, then you realize, well, we have to build a new system. 
And when you can't see the transition between system A and system B, then your mind goes to where Stephen King's was, right? Where Stephen King's writing is. And we start coming up with all of these horrific ideas. And as bad as it is, whatever's in your head is probably worse. And so my problem as an educator is when I tell people it's probably not what you think it's going to be, they think I'm saying everything's going to be super and, and wonder, and I'm not. I'm just saying it will be things that as long as you're not taken out, you can navigate through. Mm -hmm. uh, it's part of why I'm a Bitcoiner, because I believe we need batteries in our lives, right? We need, mm -hmm. when we store food as a prepper, people think of us as hoarding and some bullshit show you saw on cable television. That is not what we do. We're very basic, common sense. I have insurance in case my house burns down. My house will probably never burn down. By storing food, I have food insurance. And I will eat tomorrow and I will eat the next day. And, you know, frankly, next week, some of the people listening may not. I don't know, but I know I will. And I know I have that battery in food. I know with wealth, I have that battery in a combination of things. There's a lot of Bitcoiners that think things like silver are shit coins. Silver is nothing as an investment compared to Bitcoin, but it is an alternative. Right? It's another form of, of, of intrinsic value. So we teach things like that. We also teach things like... Your tools are an investment. So like the fact that I know how to build things and I have the tools to build things and I have the supplies to build things and they're stored in my shop, I don't know what I'm going to need next week, but I know if I need it, I can build it. Our knowledge is our batteries, our, our, our mental battery, how do you think? So you, a lot of people want to grow my own food. They, they've never grown a, a pepper. They've never grown a single leaf of lettuce, but they're going to grow their own food. After no, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> Anybody who's ever tried it knows that your first, you know, efforts into gardening will suck, and it takes a learning curve there. So, the way that we approach this fear is to stop with this intellectual masturbation that someday we're all going to be <laughs> citadel, right? And we're all going to be just fine while everybody is outside the walls dying, and they'll leave us alone. And we start realizing that like all of this has happened before. We just happen to have been born at a time where we're dealing with this particular flock or term, term you want to use, and you have to do it, right? There's a lot of things you have to do in life that you don't want to do. Nobody's really happy when they're like, I have a dentist appointment today, but you got to go, right? Nobody's really mm -hmm. excited when they have to go get their butt probed with a colonoscopy. But if you think you have you know, colon cancer, you probably need to do that. There are things that we are forced to go through as humans that are uncomfortable, but we can control our navigation through them. And the more prepared you are, the easier that will be to do. And that fear from that Reddit post begins to wane. And, and people think that we're the ones, you know, preppers are the ones that are afraid. No, I'm not afraid. You know, my, my brother-in-law got a little bit of fear looking in his eyes when he said to me one time, well, if something goes wrong, I know where I'm going. And I said, well, what are you bringing with you? Because I'm not here to take in Anybody that's just coming here to like live off of what we have, you have yeah. plenty of time leading up to this. He's a cop. I'm like, you should know better. Yeah. Right. You know, and I think there's a lot of that out there. These people that they're going to delay until the last moment, it's not going to work. And, and that's going to expect somebody else to pick up. And they yeah. have, have they, done, have prepared for them, essentially. Yes. Yeah. Well, the other thing is that they've known this is coming for a long time. But now they're starting to have that kind of come to Jesus moment with, well, someday might be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And they're seeing that that time is running out, that that sand is going through that hourglass. Mm -hmm. The good news is there's still a lot of time. The bad news is a lot of it's gone. I, I was telling people four years ago to get out of what I call Flashpoint City. So L.A., San Francisco, Portland, Seattle. And people were telling me how hard it was. And I'm like, well, in four years, it's going to be a lot harder. Yeah. It, it, tell me it's not. Right now, you need 70% more income to buy the same house you could have bought with your income four years ago. It's not gotten easier, has it, right? So, mm -hmm. But the, the, the other side of that is, well, now it's harder. Well, yeah, but in four years, it's going to be even harder if it's even an option. I believe that the window for us to get ourselves away from some of the places we need to get away from is closing. And it may never all the way close, but it doesn't matter if it's not all the way closed. Is it closed for you? Can you fit through the gap? Do you have enough money to buy your way out? If not, then it might as well be all the way closed as far as you're concerned. So I think that all of that is accruing on people's psyche. And 
a lot of people don't have an answer. Most people don't have an answer for what they're going to do. So then the hysterics take over and the fantasy takes over as well. They create this narrative of like all of us getting together or whatever. And, you know, look around. If we're not going to get together in good times, we're probably not going to get together in bad times. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's I don't really want to hear that, but tell me I'm wrong. No, it's true. It's true. Um, and that's well, actually, you know, I would take that back. It's that's not entirely true because there is essentially out of a sense of need. Uh, I'll, I'll give yeah. an example, actually, is that in 2020, when things were like really serious and everything was on lockdown and it was just kind of like weird, there was this the literal pause on the world. Um, uh, we actually got to know our neighbors for the first time. Like oh. we ended up actually getting together. And I think it was just kind of a sense of disconnectedness that like, like it was, it was this is almost this fear of like, we're totally alone unless I know someone like right here. Yeah. And like, we ended up actually going and sitting and, and they still were, you know, they're a little on the, oh, we should social distance and stuff, uh -huh. um, which I was, I was, <laughs> I was pretty quick on the, this is bullshit train like yeah. like like just the, the idea of doing stupid things to prevent like regardless of the disease this is like this and, and you know people argue about this oh it was fake oh it was you know from the wuhan lab oh it was just a flu yeah. I, I don't really give a shit that's not really relevant is that you don't <laughs> do stupid things you still that if, if it is more legitimate and it was uh, a disease i mean i called something that tested positive for covid i didn't have any fun it was pretty rough but like the idea that that just mean that just excuses doing off like dumb decisions, like really dumb decisions that are completely backwards because we have to do something. Um, anyway, Jesus Christ, um, not to stir all that mess up, but, yeah. but it was, it was great. You know, like we, I think it was, it was that sense of like being totally alone, but that's also just not the time to be having to do that. You know, well, I mean, it did bring some people together, but mostly it was yeah. least divisive, right? Mostly yeah. it was one. No, of it's gener divisive. you're generally true. The the statement yeah. you made is yeah. pretty much a general. There's still people who hate injury. each other because you didn't mm -hmm. wear your plague amulet, which was the oh, mask. Geez. Like if you yeah. go on Google Images and search for plague right. amulet, you'll find these little necklaces people wore in the 1300s and shit because they thought it would make the plague stay away. Tell me, there's a difference, like you know oh, that's that. Funny. You, it, it, it was just, it was like a token it's a, it's a great analogy that you were obedient, right? You were obedient. Mm -hmm. And then both sides hated each other, you know? Yeah. And, and now a lot of the people that were fervently on either side act like none of it ever happened. Like they yeah. just yeah. memory hold everything. Yeah. Oof. Which does not wanna... bode well for how people will likely behave when the financial system begins to unravel. Yeah, and it, um, it will. And the question is, like you said, what's going to happen? I don't know. I'm yeah, like the only yeah. person in my space that will honestly tell you I don't know. It will not be the dollars here one day and gone the next. Mm -hmm. It may feel like that at some point, but you'll see it all the way through. And what you're going to see, because history is a strong indicator, is a rebasement of the currency, a new default. People have about the dollar defaulting. Well, we've defaulted on the dollar like five times. You know, yeah. 1913 was a default. 1964 was a default. All of those were default on our word as a country to the backing of our currency. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you can go further back. There was the crime of 1873, which was the, de the original demonetization of silver, which is what, by the way, the Wizard of Oz is based on that. I don't know if you know that or not. This show is brought to you by the Cold Card Hardware Wallet. My favorite setup, which I know I talk about a lot, is the Nunchuck wallet on mobile that just connects directly to or just talks NFC whenever I need to sign. The Nunchuck does not hold my keys. It is securely on my cold card, not connected to the internet, not vulnerable to a phishing email or any malware or anything like that. If I ever need to send a transaction, I just create the transaction on my Nunchuck wallet and I tap it to my cold card, I hit sign, I tap it again, and then off it goes. There is no easier interface and way of interacting that grants a higher level of security, in my opinion, than that right there. It's genuinely incredible to me that we even have this capability in the Bitcoin space. And CoinKite has just made an entire suite of fascinating security and just fun Bitcoin devices and hardware products, like the Block Clock, 
just connect it to your node and have it show the, the Bitcoin price, have it show the block height, just right there on your desk in this really cool package. If you haven't checked out what they have to offer, you definitely need to. And don't, when you go over there, do not forget that I have a 9% discount code. Bitcoin Audible, all one word, gets you 9% off. And you can go through the link in the show notes or just remember the discount code, which is not hard. It's just the name of the show. Um, uh, you can go through the link in the show notes to go right there or just go to the store, browse around, see what you want. Get yourself a solid hardware wallet. Experience the tap to send with a cold card hardware wallet. It is, it's just kind of magical. And uh, get notified for the Q1. I'm really stoked about my, my Cypherpunk BlackBerry, the new model that's going to be coming out. So check that out as well. Um, and uh, yeah. Don't forget, 9% off. The link is right in the show notes. Go check them out. Oh, I did know that. Yeah, because Darby's oh, wow. slippers it's just one of those things. Ruby, yeah. Right? Yeah. Darby didn't have ruby slippers. In the book, she had silver, silver slippers, yep. and she walked down the golden road to the Emerald City where the man mm-hmm. behind the curtain had no real power. Yeah. And when they made the movie in the 30s and killed Julie Garland with chemicals, they made the Silvers Ruby and they said, oh, we did that because it didn't show up well in Technicolor, my ass. <laughs> like it was too close to home that way. That's why they did mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Um, well, uh, one of the things that um, that you brought up actually um, in that span that I think was really crazy to think about, but also important to remember um, that things are going to be moving really, really fast. And we're already, there's already a massive amount of momentum. There's something really interesting about the time that we live in specifically. I like to think about like the species and kind of how technology in our environment dictates how things change. Um, Because I I really think the story of history is the story of technology. Like it's about how it changes our environment and then the incentives and consequences of what it enables us to do within that new environment and what the new restrictions, how the new restrictions basically alter our power dynamics such that only a certain type of thing is generally stable. Um, and, uh, but, but regardless, and the idea that like things are speeding up. So if you look at history through a technological lens and you see it as the speed by which information, belief, or quote unquote violence, the yeah. the pressures that that indicate or that uh, force or pressure people to make decisions in certain ways that I'm not going I'm going to pay my taxes because I don't want to be in a prison. Well, what is why? Why is that? Because there's systems and technologies in place that would allow them to find me and then put me in a big cage. Um, and so like when you think about it as a con in the context of systems, what you can think you can see is like all ideas and these developments and these these relationships and power dynamics kind of move through society like like a drop of water and then a wave, right? And every every time the wave is bump and one molecule is bumping into another, it's a it's a transaction, it's a conversation, it's uh you know it's it's movement from one area to the next to drop another you know uh, drop of water and cause ripples again. You know, if you wanted to get the state of the world or the state of the mindset or the culture from Europe to the united states that ripple took six months to get there yeah and it got there super thin and almost powerless like like it could just barely touches something and touches one person and then spreads and now that ripple like every ripple or every drop that lands is massive it is insanely powerful and it spreads the globe in an instant like we're talking about hours from yeah. happening to important in everybody's mind but true disruptive yeah. technology still has a rollout period such as mm-hmm. bitcoin which sure. are where many yeah. things and yeah. this is this is hitting on something i've talked about for a long time i call it microwave culture mm-hmm. so, so I, i'm a bit older than you have been around half a century <laughs> um so i actually remember like when people didn't have microwave ovens mm-hmm. and i remember being this little kid probably seven or eight years old and i was dropped off at this diner my grandmother worked at and they have those it's old school diner with the spinny thing with the pie going around, you know, and she, do you want pie? Yeah. Apple. Okay. Do you want it hot? And I'm a little kid. I want my freaking pie now. 
And I'm like, well, how, <laughs> like I'm skeptical. Like I'm like, well, how long do I have to wait for it to be hot? <laughs> he goes a couple seconds, right? So she mm-hmm. takes this pie, shoves it in this big giant metal thing that sounds like a nuclear reactor, <laughs> hands it back to me in like 35 seconds, screaming hot. Well, I I was completely blown away by it, right? Like it mm-hmm. made like what what did you do? She's like, it's called a microwave. You know, two years later we had one in our home and five mm-hmm. years later, everybody had one and it was just basically magnets making heat. That's all it really was. But it took time. Like the first microwaves go back 15 years before that. It took time for that to roll out. But because we live in this world where somebody does something in Moscow or Sri Lanka or Japan and every, if it's work newsworthy, everybody knows it in seconds. Mm-hmm. We've gotten so much into this rapid movement that when something takes a little bit longer to happen, We convince ourselves it's not really happening, whether it's the implementation of Bitcoin over, you know, 15 years. It's like people think it's slow. That's not slow. That changing a monetary paradigm in a few decades compared to history, it's rapid. Yeah. But this has always been the way I guarantee you when people first figure out how to make gunpowder. There were a whole lot of people going, this is a gimmick. This is not the future of warfare or whatever. You know, and there mm-hmm. were guys swans and people like Jason uh, Lowry going, hey, hey, hold on. This is a whole new power projection tool. Like, just because it doesn't do everything it's going to do yet doesn't mean you can turn your back on it. And the people that didn't ended up becoming car- conquering armies and it, or did became conquering armies. And the ones that didn't, you know, they ended up getting shot. Right. And so every new technology you're talking about has this period of time it takes for it to roll out. And it also can be deceptive. Like, I remember the debate what's the future? Uh, 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 DVD or no, VHS or Betamax? Mm-hmm. I remember that debate. And like, it was a big time debate whether it was going to be VCR tapes or Betamax discs that were like as big as a record album. Yeah. And, and neither of those are anything today. And because once we got to digital, it didn't matter what media you were going to put it on because nobody put it on a media anymore. It was in a hard drive and it was transferable anywhere in the world. And so having this lag between seeing something, whether it's good or bad, and Mm -hmm. it coming to fruition and impact is just the way things are. And because we are used to things happening very, very quickly, we're often deceived by things that happen at, let's say, a normal rate or even an accelerated above normal rate, but mm-hmm. not at microwave speed. So that's our economy. Our economy is in a rapid collapse, but it looks slow compared to what we expect. We expect a movie. Somebody warns about it, and 15 minutes later, the whole thing happens, right? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. New York City froze because a scientist said it was going to happen. Yeah. You know, stuff like, I don't remember what that movie was called, but you know what I'm talking about. Uh Day after, day after tomorrow. Day after tomorrow. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like it's one of my favorite riff tracks. Later. <laughs> like, that's what everybody expects to see. That's not how life works. Like, yeah, it's gonna look freeze. It's gonna be terrible in like a hundred years. It's like, oh no, we're off by ninety nine years in eleven it's months. TV right now, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh shit. No, that's a great. That's a really interesting way to look at like human perception and think about the fact that we're everything so much movement and change in apps like i mean like even it, it's even hard to like find like a software foundation i'm not just like constantly finding a new app or a new thing or a new development like especially in like ai space is retarded you can't i can't i can't land on anything because there's a whole new platform conception model type god knows what within a couple of days and because of that it, your your perception is now that the speed of things happening is just incredibly short now, even something that might have been obvious a hundred years ago or more obvious that it was occurring because, you know, in three years, things were like really different. Now, three years feels like from a perceptions point of view, feels like, you know, 15 years probably used to. Um, yeah. And so w- we lose the ability, like our, our hyper focus on the small and the immediate that is increasingly just consuming so much of what we do because everything's moving so fast makes it just that much harder to see something that's even just at a normal pace, like three, yeah. you know, three, five years worth of change. Um, it, cuts, it cuts another way. There's an mm-hmm. author named uh, James Howard Kunstler who wrote a book called Too Much Magic. He mm-hmm. wrote a bunch of novels and stuff, but Too Much Magic, I think, I think is more of a 
too much like back face thesis. And mm-hmm. the concept is because we become so enamored with technology, we always think the solutions in technology and that, that they'll solve our problems in the future. So as long as they're not killing us today, we don't need to worry about them. So food, right? Like, so food is not going to be solved by technology anytime soon. We're not going to have Star Trek replicators, yeah. right? Where we can just mm-hmm. say, computer, I would like lobster thermidor and boom, there it is. Like that's not coming. We need to fix the problem with the food system. Like we have one, we have declining production as we destroy our agricultural systems. This is, like I said, every empire that collapsed, part of why they collapsed is they built everything on annual agriculture, which when it's done wrong is like a mining operation. You're mining yeah. topsoil away. Um, we, we export more topsoil out of this country than any other commodity when we had no money for it, though. Right. By ton, if you take the top 10 export commodities, we still export more topsoil into our oceans and rivers because of the way that we do things. We have to fix that. Like the magic won't fix that just because that's interesting. What is what was that statistic again? We Um, export more topsoil every year than we do any other 10 commodities by tonnage. Now, we don't export it like put it on a train and send it somewhere. Right. What I mean it by export is due off. to bad land management, yeah. by the way that we plow, the timing of everything that we do, we lose massive amounts of topsoil. It, you, you know, and they put it in people's mind where they can get a, a handle on it. I like to use analogies. So you think of a ton of topsoil as being a lot of topsoil. But we have mm-hmm. farms that you know number in the tens of thousands of acres, and we have tens of thousands of farms that are that. One ton of topsoil, one acre is that. One sheet of paper, the thickness of a what? sheet of paper. So if you're losing 10 sheets of paper on a 1,000 acres a year, you're losing 10,000 tons of topsoil. <laughs> There's you know surveys that are done by like NRCS where they show a guy standing up on a hill, and then there's a field here, and he's got a two-meter stick, measuring sticks sitting down there, and it looks like it's a hill. Well, no, what it is is that was never formed. And that's 200 years of farming has dropped the level of the land by six feet. And so we can't fix that with high technology. We can fix that with advanced agricultural technology. That's part of what we talk about. Cover cropping, no till. Man, that's crazy. Right? Like that's the thing that we need to be doing to solve these problems. But here's here's the bad news. People are starting to do it, even on the larger producer end, but it's still a tiny drop in the bucket. It's not going to move fast enough to fix the problem. So that's why we try to teach, like, do what you can in your own backyard. Like, if everybody Mm -hmm. out there was producing a little bit of their own food, it could buy us a massive amount of time. If everybody out there was a little smarter with with their money, it could buy us a massive amount of time to make these longer structural changes. But since it's probably not going to happen that way, then you better do it for yourself. Yeah. Man, that's crazy. I don't think I'd ever heard that statistic. And uh, there's a great book on basically just largely like the consequences, like like just kind of like detailing out the unraveling, the the unsettling of America, which is what it's uh, what it's called. Yeah. Um, can't remember the author's name. I just remember that the Ron Swanson guy voices it. Oh, oh um, I love him. <laughs> it's a great audio book. Um, but there's a ton of that, uh, yeah. like just realizing that we have this like crazy focus and this is like one of those things i just read a piece by uh Dergigi on free speech that one of the biggest problems of society and uh, like one of the meta problems of society is trying to figure out what problem we need to solve and climate change is like a great example of this is that like you're supposed to care and believe and worship climate change above, above any and all other problems and yet There's no sort of immediate concern, even if it is real. CO2 is good for the planet. Like NASA is literally, they call it the great greening because higher concentration of CO2 is wonderful for life. Um, And and we're at a, you know, 60 million year, 100 million year low. Like it's never been this low before. Earth has been just tons and tons of more CO2 than it's ever been. We're, we're, in, we're actually closer to life can't be sustained at like a, a sub 150 parts per million versus 
what the Cambrian explosion had, which was 8,000, which we could burn all of the oil in existence for 2,000 years and we wouldn't get 8,000 parts per million. So anyway, um, but this uh, important thing about free speech in there is that the problem is figuring out what problem is important. And we're actually letting our farm, the, the shit that decides whether or not we eat next year. Like we are destroying it like 15 different ways, like stuff that's like crazy, crazy unhealthy. And soil is a resource that just doesn't come back. You no. know, like talking about the degree to rebuild it and it's not dude, easy. Yeah, it takes it's time. a mess. And we are treating it like shit. We're strip mining it. Well, now the carbon thing is interesting because you're not going to get me siding with the global warming yahoos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I will tell you there is a carbon problem. And mm -hmm. understand the carbon problem, you have to first acknowledge the fact that carbon is an element, right? It is not a molecule of combined elements. It's a single element. Mm -hmm. And there's only one place you get elements as high as carbon and higher and, and some that are actually lower on the table. And that is it's formed in a star, mm -hmm. right? We can't make carbon. We have all the carbon that we've ever had and we have all the carbon that we ever will have unless uh, some sort of asteroid that has carbon as part of it crashes into our planet. We got what we got. Yeah. And there's a cycle for carbon. And the place that we don't have enough carbon right now is in our soils. When we first settled North America, and I'm talking European settlement, uh, carbon or organic matter con uh, content in our soils throughout the country were anywhere between 2 and 12%. The farmland that is the, you know, the envy of the world in the Midwestern United States right now, the average farm has less than half of a percent of organic matter. Now, to get the carbon in the soil, it has to come from somewhere. It has to be cycled. Mm -hmm. And the way that we cycle it is with plants. So this thing of keeping the fields bare, except when we're growing corn and beans, this is the exact wrong answer. We need to be using uh, plant species we refer to as cover crops, which keep living root in the soil and cover on the soil at all times. And they pull carbon from the atmosphere and they put it into the soil and that carbon mm -hmm. cycles. So it's not like gone forever. It's not leading to an ice age. But if we did that, your erosion stops, your moisture retention goes up, the nutrient density of your food, like everything they say we need gets better by increasing the organic matter and the biology in the soil. So this is an interesting way to look at that. What would you think of a farmer who didn't make sure his livestock had enough to eat? Probably stupid and evil, right? Like they're going to die. Yeah. You're going to make no money. You're going to go broke. And you're an asshole because you're starving your cows. You're starving your chickens. You're a dick. You're committing mm -hmm. animal abuse. <laughs> well, the, the majority of life on a farm is under the soil. It's bacteria. It's fungi. It's macro and micro arthropods. And it is where all the cycling happens. So what do we do? We chemically feed the plant at the expense of the soil till everything in the soil is dead. You're not feeding the life. Like your job as a farmer or a gardener even, feed the soil life, the soil life feeds the plant. The plants actually eat bacteria. They literally suck them up in their roots like vacuum cleaners. That's a rather new discovery. We always thought that relationship when you got into soil science, I mean, no kidding. PhDs believed this 10 years ago. Uh -huh. The bacteria goes to the root because the root exudates some sugars and carbohydrates and a little bit of protein, and they exchange things. No, the plant's like, yeah, come over here, bitch, and sucks its ass up and kills it and eats it, right? So, so even the vegans, you're eating something that's a predator, right? Like plants are predatory. Um, and, and <laughs> that's an interesting way to think about it. Soil, but if we're not feeding the soil web. Yeah then we're growing plants that can't possibly feed us. And if you're like, I'm a very much a carnivorous person. I eat mm -hmm. you know, peppers and tomatoes and leafy greens and meat. Yeah. But my meat has to have grass and forbs to eat. And it has to have high quality soils or I have poor quality meat. Yeah. Right. So How do you get it? Uh, this, is, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I'm curious, what's your, because I'm, and even more, more recently, I'm at least a steak a day, sometimes okay. two. Um, and uh, how, where do you source your meat? I run out of meat really quick. And I do. I mean, obviously, I have a freezer and I intend to have a larger freezer and yeah. stockpile for very long spans of time downstairs. But it's still uh, we're not done yet. We still have a lot to do. Yeah. Um, what's your 
a meat source, just in the sense of it's what should multiple. I be looking for? Yeah, I mean, it's multiple. But for example, I have a dude that lives a mile down the road from me that I buy a half mm-hmm. a cow from every year. So that okay, that, you you've done the the half a cow thing, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like he he'll sell you a whole one. He does the thing where he drops it off at the processor, and mm-hmm. then you pay for the processing because they can't. There's all kinds of regulations to get in the way of this. And when yeah. he first talked to me about it, I'm like, I, I don't want a whole cow at once because I have other sources of meat too. And so he just paired me up with another customer and we split a cow. And then gotcha. I take like all the bones, all the organs, because the guy I got paired up with doesn't want that. He just wants red meat. So mm-hmm. I get the bone for bone stock and all that. I raise my own stuff. I, I have ducks that I raise. I have chickens that I raise. Some of those get cold. I hunt. So like, you know, last year I put like four deer in the freezer. Right. That's why I don't want to hold wow. a cow. I need places yeah, yeah. for other things to go. Uh, and, and I wish I would say that I never eat any meat out of the mainstream meat system, but I mm-hmm. do because, you know, there's limits to what any of us can do. Yeah. Uh, but I eat almost exclusively protein and fat. And then my, again, my vet, I eat almost no starches. And if I'm going to do it, I do it. Like I, I was on someone else's show recently. I said, I eat probably 12 potatoes a year. And he's like, all at once. I'm like, no, but you know, like I, I don't eat anything with seed oils. I mean, that's a huge, yeah, yeah, me neither. Like, no, Stay away from that oil, shit. no fructose corn syrup, no words I can't pronounce on the label. Yeah. Like, none of that shit. Like, even if you're going to live off more conventional starchy vegetables and stuff like that, cook from scratch. That, that's the best advice I can give anybody. But there's there's something more to this. Mm-hmm. Again, being you know over fifty, I remember the eighties in school, the seventies in school, and I remember like in your class you had like, and when I say class, I mean like the whole school, not just your classroom. The fat yeah. kid, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. And if you talk to somebody yeah, fifty yeah, years yeah. old and say, "Who was the fat kid in high school?" They can probably give you a name. Yeah, I would say Jason Kochik. Sorry, Jason, you were fat. You know, it is. <laughs> now they might be able to tell you who the skinny kid was. Like we have. Fat people everywhere. Yeah. They're not eating. People don't. It's so crazy. People have no. It's again, one of those, like, you don't see it because you're too close to it. And it's a bigger trend. It's, you know, 10 year, 15 year trend. And this is. Holy crap. We are the most unhealthy, most shockingly obese, malnourished. And people don't realize that it's malnourishment. It's a product of fake food. It's yes, it not, is. it's a, it's aggressively trying to put away carbs and sugars and energy production without any of the nutrients to properly process it. It's fiat food is what um, it is. It really is. And it's, it is the fructose corn syrup. It is the oils, but there's yeah. something more to like, why we all have chronic illness is the worst chronic illness epi- epidemic in the history of mankind. Like it's like insane. Yeah. So and we've convinced people these illnesses are actually diseases instead of lifestyle conditions. So like the mm-hmm. most rapidly growing illness in America is type two diabetes mm-hmm. with some very rare exceptions. Cause there's always the unicorn that gets pissed off at me. It's a hundred percent reversible with diet. The people are mm-hmm. spending 12 to $18,000 a year on Ozempic, right? Yeah plus insulin, plus metformin for a disease. And they have convinced themselves because it's more fun to believe that this just happened to me. I didn't do this to myself. Yeah, It's not my fault. I got sick. And now that I'm sick, I need this medicine for the rest of my life that I would like somebody else to pay for, by the way, I'm just saying. And this is leading to the largest chronic disease that we've ever seen in human history. Now I'm not saying like more people didn't die of smallpox. I'm talking about chronic illnesses, yeah. not acute illnesses. The state of insane unhealthiness. Yes. Basically. Yes. Yeah. And this is, you want a survival topic. This is a survival topic. People are drastically shortening their lives and the system that's supposed to be helping is encouraging the very behavior causing the problem. This is the, a, a grinding stone I have right now. There's a company called Davita, D-A-V-I-T-A. And Davita mm-hmm. makes dialysis equipment. That's the only way they make money is somebody is in kidney failure and has to go weekly or biweekly to get dialysis. And I'm, I'm good friends with Dr. Ken Berry. He's a big-time influencer in the carnivore, ketivore space. And he made a statement on my show one time, and I, I just kind of like, it's a little hyperbole. He's like, there's more dialysis clinics than there are Subway sandwich restaurants now. 
And then I started paying attention to it. And son of a bitch, between my house and Fort Worth, which is about 20 miles, on one state highway, there are three, guys, three dialysis clinics, two owned by DaVita. DaVita is a strategic partner with guess who? The American Diabetes Association. And they get together and they formulate recipes for kidney health for diabetics. Because, of course, DaVita, who has 6,600 dialysis clinics, wants less type 2 diabetes and yeah. less dialysis customers because that will benefit them. I don't know how. Some of their recipes include things like oatmeal cranberry breakfast cookies. You're telling an obese person with type 2 diabetes oh to eat oatmeal cranberry cookies for breakfast. This is done wide out in the open. And, you know, when I, I talk about a lot of things, I get a lot of traction. I can't get any traction with this. Nobody cares. Nobody gets like that is like Satan having sex with Satan and making baby Satans. Right out <laughs> the open, and it's everybody's OK with it. Everybody's okay with the doctors and they have white coats. It's because it's inside the Overton window, man. Yeah. That's because it, it, they think it's it is normal and therefore it's acceptable. And we've lost our frame of reference as to cause and effect. Good lord. Um and what makes sense. We we've gone through a huge period of just of doing what we're told. Of doing, yeah. of, of thinking that the best course of action, I mean, Jesus, I uh, heard this so many times in 2020. I was just trying to be a good person. I was just trying to do what I was told. Like people who were like dis destroyed, like immune systems or paralyzed by the vaccine or, you know, all the, just the mess that went on. And, uh, and, and it's, it gets me now because like, I remember, I still remember that perspective. Like I, I still remember in high school and college and thinking that the good thing was to do what everyone else told me to do, like to do yeah. what the authority said. I get my gold star when I repeat what the teacher said. I just brought um, it up so your people I know, I just, see. Like, I'm not pulling this out of my ass. This is a joint project between DaVita and the American Diabetes Association, and there's what they're telling diabetics to eat. You know, I mean, it's got sugar, like, in the recipe, but it's natural sugar and it's got dried cranberries that are pure sugar and they're doing this. And I do think that people believe that when they, when they listen to it's doctors and do what they're told that they're, that they're being good people. I think you're dead on. I think there was, mm -hmm. that was part of why we were, those of us that didn't partake in the stupidity during COVID, that's why we were so hated. Because they really did think we were bad, evil people hurting other people. Like the people that bought into it, they believe that. I, I had one person seriously tell me that I was the reason people were dying in Washington State because I was fishing in the woods without a mask on. And, you know, and they say it with like, wait a minute, you're, you're not serious. Oh, yeah. I'm I, and your brain's broke. And there's people that are still broken from it. Like yeah. you see them, guy. I know you see them. Like they're just broken forever. And I know you have to know about the experiment with the electrocuting people. Do you? Wait. So I don't think I know this. They, there was an experiment that was done. I can't remember what it was originally. It might've been done in Germany. They, and it was like in the fifties or sixties, they were trying to figure mm -hmm. out how did Nazi Germany happen? Oh, did, oh I know what you're talking about. People let about. this happen. Yeah. And they had these doctors and they were telling people this guy in the other room, when he gets the answer wrong, electrocute him. And every time he got electrocuted, the power went up to the point where they said, if he gets to this level, it could kill him. And most of the people, when they were told by the guy in the white coat to go ahead and push the button anyway, did it. It was something like 20% of people said, no, I'm not going to do that. 80% of people, because the authority figure said to do it, they went along with it. Yeah. And it wasn't now, even a, yeah. the, one of the crazy things about that experiment is that it wasn't a forced study. You know, and they yeah. were able to hear, they were able to hear the consequences of this. The actor yeah. was screaming and, you know, yeah. doing the, yeah. doing the whole thing. And, uh, even despite feeling uncomfortable, there was no, they could have just gotten up and walked out. Like it, it's they done anything. It. nobody was trapping yeah. them. They weren't forced no. into this and nobody had a gun. Nobody said, like, you're going to yeah. get thrown out of school if you don't do it. Like there was no mm. consequence to saying no. And still they did it. And somebody read to the study in the eighties. 
because they said, well, maybe it was the culture where it was done or whatever. And it, like everywhere it's ever been done, the results were very, very close to the same, about 80-20. So yeah. about 20% of people will not electrocute you to death because you answered an arithmetic question wrong because a guy in a white coat told them to do it. And now oh, look at a, the state. That's a look, sobering reality. Too. All right. Yeah. Now look at the state of the world and where we're headed. Yeah. And those are the people around you. Yeah. Swan Bitcoin has the full suite of Bitcoin financial services. You can instantly buy with your bank account or wire transfer any amount of Bitcoin up to $10 million worth. And you can easily set up what I have been doing for ages, which is an automatic purchase of Bitcoin on a weekly or monthly basis. You just pick your time frame and then automatically withdraw it to your cold storage. And still they have free withdrawals to self-custody, which I was sure would be gone by now. But you should always treat any custodian as a point of failure. And luckily, you won't have to go anywhere for all of the information and advice you need for why you should withdraw and how to do it safely. Because Swan Bitcoin has all of the resources you need and will regularly remind you. About 80% or more of their customers automatically withdraw their coins. That is an amazing feat, if you ask me. Then they also have the Swan IRA if you have a traditional IRA and you want to get it out allocated to Bitcoin. And there's so much more. With Swan Private, they have inheritance planning. You also have Swan business accounts, and you can even do Bitcoin as a part of your employee benefit plans. They have an advisory. They have the Swan Vault, a multi-sig service for, for those who want to have the benefits of holding the majority of their keys, but still also want to be able to rely on a trusted institution in the case of an emergency or a disaster. If you haven't started into Bitcoin yet, Swan is an amazing place to begin. Go to swan.com slash guy. The link will be right there in the description. Again, that is swan.com slash guy. And they will know that I sent you and my beautiful face will be right there at the top of the page to greet you. I am a longtime user myself and a huge thank you to Swan for supporting this show. And I definitely recommend you check them out. Jesus. Um, so speaking of. But preppers uh, are crazy, guy. We're preppers crazy. are crazy. Preppers are crazy. <laughs> we're crazy, yeah. Preppers are the only ones that were probably sitting pretty in 2020. Oh, my life didn't change, dude. I mean, it really didn't. Like, I really? just went on with my life. Like, nothing nothing really changed. Like, some of the restaurants I like to go to were closed. That was, yeah. that was the sum total. I was eating ribeye and asparagus and, you know, having a beer at night on the back porch. And I've got my little fiefdom here and when we wanted to go somewhere we just went and when they told us to wear a mask we're like this is texas fuck off we're not doing it and we just didn't participate we just ignored yeah. everything and the good news is this dynamic works in reverse so you know you walk into walmart some minimum wage person is sitting there would you like a mask sir no i have three of them and you just walk past them mm -hmm. and then they sit there like well i'm not tackling this dude for eight bucks yeah. an hour. i'm not doing so you go through the store and you get some weird look, but then some of the people that are in there with their face diaper on, they look at you and they realize, and they look around and they're like, oh. And then you, you start seeing like half the people. Yeah. Because I had, I had, I had one of those moments with somebody right? actually in yeah. an aisle. It was, it yeah. was pretty funny. And it is, yeah. it is pretty amazing too, with the perception of all of the force that was involved. Think about how much of it wasn't actually backed up by anything. I think a lot of people made the mistake of being combative about it. Yeah, and no, no. I was always super polite and yeah. be like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm just not doing that. And yeah. uh, and then I would just immediately pull them into a different conversation. Like I would just ask them an arbitrary question. Like, do you know where yeah. so-and-so is? And then they just engage yeah. you as a person and yeah. you just go about your way. Um, I did get some looks and I do remember hearing somebody um, say something. Is anybody going to put a like, is anybody going to tell him about the mask or something? something? Um, yeah. And uh, I was at Whole Foods. No. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, there. And, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> but other than that, you know, outside of making the situation uncomfortable, clearly a couple of times, it's pretty much, it was pretty much a nothing burger. Uh, granted, this area also wasn't like horrendous about that sort yeah. of thing. Where, where um, are you at? I'm in North Carolina. Oh, okay. okay. People are pretty hospitable and yeah. tend to want to be nice over being a dick. It's not a New York yeah. sort of situation. Um, so, uh, but 
and nonetheless though like the pressure was there and like one of those things one of the things too just in the thinking about how to um uh, kind of prep for when things do get rough is one yeah. of the most important things to do is to be willing to let it get uncomfortable yes it is because so much dr is driven by the fact that people don't want it to be uncomfortable therefore they will do some bad thing or they will compromise on th something be polite but let it get uncomfortable because if we're not able to if we're not willing to let things get uncomfortable for what we think is right and what we think is intelligent and the proper course of action then we're certainly not like do we literally want it to get to a point where we have to engage yeah. you know like it, it's, yeah. it's the minor engagements that us being frankly put and i know i've been this in the past a coward to not say something uncomfortable or to force a situation when I just knew I wasn't like there was nothing wrong. Like this was a ridiculous situation. Um, well, but, at least the irrational behavior, right? Yeah, so think yeah. about one of like there were a lot of things that went in short supply, but I remember seeing people loading up like five cases of bottled water during mm -hmm. COVID. Well, what are you doing? <laughs> Did your faucet not work at home? Why, why are you paying 80 cents a bottle for cases of water, right? What do you, this isn't a hurricane. Everybody always gets water. Yeah, everybody gets water. I mean, to some degree, it's like, sure, paper. but. You know, like, so here's, if you don't wiggle, there's a problem. Get a water you filter. probably won't have a problem. So you get a filter. But the other thing is, like, they make these things called bottles. And you can turn a faucet and the water will fill up the bottle and you put the lid on it and you put it on the shelf. Now you have water. Right. So if your water actually does have a problem, like you lose pressure and you don't have water for a while, you have a reserve. And so what you have to do with water to make it last long term is don't put anything bad in it. Like you don't have to do it. You don't have to put chlorine or some shit in it. You could just as long as there's nothing in there to grow, you're, it might taste a little flat or something, but mm -hmm. your water's good for years. And then you just use the water from the bottles and rotate it. So like. We tell people to start with the things that are free to do. So that would be the first thing. Start by storing water. Uh, if you drink soda or like Arizona iced tea or any of the big heavy duty jugs, then mm -hmm. rinse those out really good and fill them up with water and build up a supply of water. If you don't drink that, good for you. I don't either. You know somebody who does. Ask them mm -hmm. to save them for you until you have enough that you feel comfortable you supply. Now you have water in either two liter or one gallon jugs. It's portable. You can move it around. You can take it with you. This makes a lot more sense than, you know, if you want a pond, put one in, but don't put it in just so you'll have water, put it in so you'll have a pond, right? Or when it comes to food, get a, a cheap notebook, throw it on your countertop, write down everything you eat for a couple of weeks. And if you eat something you already put on the list, put an X next to it. Now, that's what you store because that's what you eat. That's what your kids eat. Mm -hmm. Don't go to freaking Patriot bullshit supply or whatever and buy a bunch of freaking macaroni for five times what it costs to buy macaroni for. Like, I've, I have made so much less money in my space because I don't work with people like that. I get people all the time. Mm -hmm. We have this great long-term storage for you. Look at it. It's all like chemicals and macaroni and beans. Like, yeah. if you want to store macaroni and beans, we have some five-gallon buckets. Go buy a bunch of macaroni and beans, throw them in the bucket, then get a, you know, the hand warmers that they sell in winter. Those are great. They're nice and warm. Yeah, yeah. They're, an, they're an oxygen absorber. They're the exact same thing. What they have is I'm they kidding. have so iron. like a silica packet. Right. Well, they have is iron filings mm -hmm. and, a, and, a, and an additional chemical that causes the iron to rust rapidly. Mm -hmm. That's what they are. That's and that's why they get hot. Because when you rust. It's like a tiny, it, slow oxidant, like a tiny, so fly, slow fire. Like, it's actually, yeah, it's actually a really fast oxidation of iron to make rust, that's right? That's interesting, yeah. Well, when you rust iron, you create iron oxide. So what do you have to do? You have to pull the oxygen out and bond it in a covalent bond to the iron. So when you take a hand warmer and throw it in a five-gallon bucket full of beans and put the lid on it, it bonds with all the oxygen that's there, and then it poops out, right? So you want to store long-term dry goods. You can store beans, macaroni, wheat berries, all that shit – forever that way we don't do a lot of it because we don't eat it but it, you know if my brother-in-law comes up i'm not actually gonna throw him out he can live on corn and wheat <laughs> I, I, he can live on corn and wheat you know and he can pull security detail yeah. walking around the property with his gun you, you gotta have your defense team so he, yeah. he, he does yeah. bring something to the table 
I, I had a good friend in this space. He used to say it's easier to free, feed your neighbors than kill them. Yeah. Right? <laughs> or like peasant food. Yeah, and then yeah. you like, and I don't think we're going to get into that type of arrangement, but I always say, you know, there's a lot of things I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think when I go out with my wife tomorrow that somebody's going to try to shoot me, but mm. I'm going to carry my gun because they might. Yeah. Right. And and I actually carry a gun. Less Insurance because isn't about it. doing, it isn't about like you thinking it's going to happen or that yeah. it's necessary that it happens. Quite, quite the contrary is that you don't know. Yeah. You have no idea and you want to plan as if it doesn't. But if it does, you don't want it to hurt 10 times more than it needs to hurt, you know, yeah. like, yeah. You know. I mean, most people have insurance on their home because, well, you can't get a mortgage without it. But if you pay your mm -hmm. house off, unless you're stupid, you don't cancel your homeowner's insurance. Yeah. Because if your house burns down, you've got a problem. You probably don't have a lot of bills to like rebuild your house that costs like five times more than it did when you bought it. Right. Mm -hmm. So like we have insurance for so many things. But then the things that we actually rely on a daily basis, a lot of times that are easy to self-insure, we don't self-insure those. Like I said, the gun thing, I don't carry a gun so much because I'm afraid somebody should shoot me. Because if you shoot me, I'm dead. I can't shoot you back, right? Yeah. And if you're in a situation, like if you're not walking around like you know Bob London or something like you're in the old West, <laughs> if somebody okay. wants to hurt you, they're probably going to hurt you before you know they want to. Right. Mm -hmm. So you still try to defend yourself. The main reason I carry a gun is because I could be in a situation to defend somebody else. Yeah. Because I'm in an ideal yeah. situation when I'm the third party and I can observe the interaction. And if you watch a lot that's of that's an important perspective. That's a that's yeah. an important thing to think about is that it might not be you that's even in danger. It might be somebody else. And you're gonna be the only everybody else is gonna stand around and film it. Yep. You know, yep. like, and if it's a mass shooting, just because you're not the first one doesn't people. mean you won't be in the, in the order, but at least now you have a way to respond. I mean, you know, basic preparedness to me, you, you score, square up your, your six primary survival needs. So yeah. you've got food and we kind of talked about that already. Basic copy canning is what we call it Buy the store where you eat and eat where you store. And we probably don't have enough time to go much further than that, but also, holistically produce some of your own food and no local producers. Like you do that, you go a long way right there. Water. Okay. We kind of covered that. Make sure you have water stored in reserve. Uh, you need uh, security and security is the one that most people fall back on. They either go crazy with it and they build yep. up like this arsenal and they're going to fight <laughs> world war 97 when the Belgians come and gas us with the world trade organization or whatever bullshit's in their head. Right. Or they do nothing. They do yeah. nothing. And the reason people do nothing with security is it's the one survival need you can live your entire life and not worry about. And maybe it won't matter because somebody yeah. else is providing it for you. But the minute that apparatus security ends down, up being a tragedy of the commons situation yeah. where people people basically are free riders yeah. on their name. Like if my neighbor has a security system or there is a a police officer down the street, you know, like that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Like it, it's a collective. And it's a thing. facade, right? Because the minute some point. dude decides he doesn't care about the risk mm -hmm. and he walks up and puts a screwdriver between your third and fourth long, uh, rib, you've got a problem. It doesn't matter that a cop might show up sooner or later. You've got yeah. that problem now. Or if the whole apparatus breaks down. But mm -hmm. my point with security is, is you can do without it for one millisecond when you need it. When you need it, you have one millisecond and it's gone. So we shore up security. That's that's more than just a gun. That's situational awareness. I recommend everybody have at least a basic understanding of basic martial arts, how to handle your body and move. Understand that if you have a gun and there's an altercation, it's an armed altercation. Like you come after me. You don't have a gun. You're trying to beat me with a rock or something. I pull my gun out. If I don't know how to handle myself, I'm as likely to get shot with it as you are. Yeah. I don't need to be good with the gun. I need to be go good with my body and how I move my body and how I control it, right? If I'm the party of attack. So we shore up security. We also need to worry about energy. In wilderness survival training, we don't call it energy. We call it fire, right? So if you go take a bushcrafting course, they will teach you how to make a fire. Because if you have a fire, you can cook, you can dry clothes, you can stay warm, you can make tools. Well, in our society, what we have for that is electricity, right? And and, and various forms of other fuels like propane, uh, diesel, gasoline, et cetera. So, I mean, I recommend everybody have at least two to three weeks of backup power capability. 
what's your dominant way to do that? I'm I'm curious. I'm I'm in a pretty populated. I'm on like kind of the edge edge, not yeah. quite the kind of suburbs of a city. Um, and so, but it is also rural. You know, it's, yeah. it's North Carolina. So, um, your but easy answer is a generator. Your easy answer is a generator. It's just going to have, it only goes so, so long, right? That's mm -hmm. your, this is where you break into self reliance and self sufficiency. Mm -hmm. So, self reliance will measure in time. So, if I have a generator and I have enough gas to run that generator to run my systems for three weeks, I have three weeks of energy self reliance. If I have mm -hmm. a solar array, that provides me 50% of my power needs, then I have 50% self-sufficiency and that's for all intents and purposes eternal. Like that stuff does wear out eventually, but you're like 25, 30 year life cycle. It's a while. Yeah. It's a right. Long time. So, yeah. So I think I even the warranty is t like on, it years. must produce the, the thing is like, no, I mean like, on, on oh. like its output is like 10 years. Yeah. Um, they've gotten, they've got, they've progressed a lot. It's so panels, crazy. Panels will generally degrade by 2% per year. Interesting. Okay. Right. So it's, it, it does, it, it's like compound interest in reverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's accelerated as you go on, but you'll generally lose about 2% of your production cast capacity a year. But 20 years, you're still making a lot of power out of, let's say, mm -hmm. a four or six K system. I like the hybrid design of those because now you can have solar. You can install batteries so that you're storing the solar energy. You have a generator that you can top up the batteries mm -hmm. on low. Out, and then you have kind of the best of both worlds. I don't have everything that I would like to have with that. We're all limited. Like right now, I'd rather have more Bitcoin. I know that sounds crazy mm -hmm. for a prepper to say that, but th they could shut my power off. And for a good month, I wouldn't really have to worry about it. And that's just a function of storing enough fuel to run your generators. If you're doing gas, you know, I have a real simple way of storing gasoline, and it, it's it's good all around. And that is you go out, today is, it's March, go out and buy a gas can today. If you can't do a bunch of it at once, you're going to do it one at a time. Buy a gas can this month, get a Sharpie marker, write a big number three on it, fill it up with gas. When you go to the, the gas station, fill your car, bring it home, and put it on the shelf in your shop. April, put a four on it. Keep doing that till you get all the way back around. You got 60 gallons. When you get back to March, take the gas can dump it in your vehicle, go fill it up, fill the can up, put it back on the shelf. You will never have gas that's too old. You'll never have gas that goes bad. You don't need stabilizer. You don't need anything because you're cycling it through. You want to have plug cans every month. It's like a cache. It's like a, like a computer cache. Yeah. It's a battery. It's a fossil yeah. fuel battery instead of an electric battery, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got to shore up your energy needs. Um, you have to worry about health and sanitation. So if you're on maintenance medication or whatever, and you don't have 90 day supply, you need a doc, talk to your doctor. If your doctor will not fix that for you, you need a new doctor, right? Yeah. And then try to get off of what you can. Like I said, we have tons of people with these chronic diseases. If they would change their lifestyle, right? They would be so much better off. Five years ago, I weighed 70 pounds more than I do because I got really comfortable with my success and mm -hmm. I could have a drink and eat in the middle of the day. So I did. And I did that for a number of years, even though I was talking about being healthy. It just, it can happen to anybody. And when I decided to change that, I had already understood the low carb thing, but I had just discovered like the keto thing, getting a lot of your calories yeah. from good, clean fats, getting off the seed oils. I did that in a weight, just, I mean, hell, there's a video of me drawing a 35 pound plate. And it I was, said, you know, as of this it day, was epic. Lost, when okay. when my uh, it was funny, my wife um was going through like some weird issues. She couldn't figure out what was like causing it, and you know, some skin stuff like eczema, and uh, like way back when. And she went to a doctor to you know sort it out, and it was basically like those oatmeal sugar cookies or whatever. Like the yeah. doctor literally told her to eat all of this awful stuff. Like it was all like oat cereals and corn based product and like all this stuff. It's like literally the worst thing. And everything got worse. Like everything got worse. And like new stuff was creeping up like really quick. She was like, yeah. what in the hell is going on? And uh, and it was funny. That was when she found paleo. She found the whole uh, it starts with food and the kind of whole 30 theory, you know, the, the perspective of mm -hmm. eating, eating single ingredient foods and then working backwards. 
Um, and I ended up doing it with her just kind of out of like my, my diet was basically cereal, pop tarts and pizza, you know, it was awful, (laughs) horrifying actually, when I think back on it now. Um, and, uh, uh, she, she started doing it and I was like, all right, well, I'll do the paleo. I'll do it all with you. Yeah. And I was editing, like I, I was a film editor and like did wedding videos and like local commercials and like that yeah. sort of stuff. Um, so I was sitting on my ass every day in front of the computer, you know, watching the same two seconds oh, over and trying to figure out a different way to cut it. Um, and I lost like 15 or 20 pounds in an insanely short amount of time. And I was never a heavy person. Yeah. Like I've always been a lanky dude, but like yeah. I suddenly was just like, it was funny. It was like, I was just kind of like a little bit swollen everywhere. Like I was like puffy cheek. Like I look back at the pictures. And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm like a, like a bubble. Like, <laughs> you know, it's like weird. And like, suddenly like I had definition in my face and like all my, I was like, what in the hell is happening? I just switched to bacon and eggs because I didn't know what else to eat. And I just was like, I was straight up just eating bacon and eggs all yeah. the time and some yeah. green beans out of a can. Yeah. And that's it. That's my whole diet. Like, and that's basically what I got now on bacon and eggs in the morning. Cheat or whatever is yeah. a banana and eggs made into pancakes to okay. the only two ingredients. And like my son loves it. Um, yeah. uh, but, and then steak, you know, and, but it's, it's like night and day, you know, it was crazy. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I want to go back to the battery thing really quick. What's, okay. And I'm just curious about your setup because I know like Bitcoin and I'm, and I get on people about this. Like yeah. you're all, you should all feel guilty if you still aren't using Bitcoin day to day. Like if you aren't utilizing it and learning the tools, because if the shit hits the fan and Bitcoin is the only thing you better, sh- yeah. you shouldn't be learning then. You're correct, you shouldn't be learning. Correct, I agree. Then. Anyway. Um, so on the whole battery thing, like you're, you're out in the wild. You have a lot of land. Um, yeah. do you it's just have three acres? It's not huge. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. Modest. Um, in the context of like the, the average Suburbs. person who's like, yeah. was like, yeah. okay, I have a sort of a backyard. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, what, uh, how is your solar setup and your battery situation to, and, and what do you probably rec- recommend it and work? I run primarily, honestly, off grid, uh, not off grid, off the grid. I don't have mm-hmm. a huge amount of, uh, alternative energy i rely mostly on generator and fuel for outages i have some solar i have a basic in my closet i have a battery system that's made of 12 uh standard lead acid batteries and -hmm. that can run my entire office for like two days wow so i can sit in here and i can still work Mm -hmm. uh, without going on out there uh, mm-hmm. I would like to up that, but again, there's financial considerations. I also live in a place where when I look at my ROI, it is much easier to do the off-grid thing. If you really want to do the off-grid thing, go somewhere north. You can make heat easy. Cut yeah. trees, stick it in a stove, and burn it. You got all the heat you want, right? Mm-hmm. Keeping the house cool. This is the biggest reason I haven't gone all in on full-scale yeah. solar Keeping the house cool in the in the summer here. I mean, I, I say, and I people think it's a joke. I'm kind of serious. From like July to the end of September, the sun tries to kill you here. <laughs> if you're like, you know, when you're a kid with a magnifying glass and ants, that's how the yeah, sun yeah. feels here, right? Like hobbits come and throw rings in my backyard to get rid of them and shit in, in August, right? Like, so I can only keep the house so cool and then. The, the, the way to fix that in the South is to build like in ground houses, like mm-hmm. earth chip style houses and all. Well, where I live, that would require dynamite. Like I have very mm-hmm. thin soils and then we are rock. And when I say rock, I don't mean pieces of rock. I mean limestone. So 50 million years ago, there was a thing called the Great Inland Sea, went right through the middle of North America and it was all mm-hmm. ocean. And there was actually two continents. And my Ooh. house would be underwater at that time. And that's why we have so much oil and gas through that piece of the country, through Texas and up through Oklahoma and all because of all that ocean uh, uh, material. And so when you dig a hole at my prop, very quickly you get to something that looks just like concrete. And when you get it closer, what would normally be like the, the stone mixed into the concrete is shells. So I can't go into the ground and I'm not going to sweat. So I'm not going to spend 
$20,000 on a solar array that's going to take me 15 years to pay back. It's just not going to do yeah. that. We What we've actually been doing heavily lately, we've been shopping for land and so that we have a fallback location that can be more of an off-grid type thing if it got that. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in a, a similar boat, um, especially with like the availability of uh, capital and kind of the market right now for it. Like, yeah, uh, obviously I want to refinance when if interest rates go get plummet again, but, um, I probably get a half reasonable price because of where we are in the cycle. Um, and, but I'm feeling like I need like a bug out zone, you you know, know, we have a land, a a house, a cabin sort of thing. On the solar, we have a Telegram group, mm-hmm. and a lot of stuff goes on between guys in there where they get together and buy like pallets of solar panels directly, and then break them up. And they'll even have somebody maybe deliver them. Like we have, yeah. and we have like a, a professional solar engineer that's part of our expert council that works mm-hmm. with people like that as well to to to, to build things up. Um, see, I don't believe in the type of apocalypse that a lot of people do. Like it's going to be like Jericho or something, right? Like, yeah, yeah. I think that we're going to have these transitional periods. You need to be able to get through them, et cetera. If I was trying to prepare for the end of the world as we know it for all time, I would pick up and I would really, and I would go north and I would be at a place with a lot more water, a lot deeper soils, a lot cooler summers. And I wouldn't carry, again, I wouldn't carry out a cold winter because you give me a chainsaw Right and a little bit of gasoline and and I can build a rocket mass heater and I can heat a house with the I don't even need a chainsaw I can heat a house through a winter in a cold climate with the shit that falls out of the trees with the scrap wood uh, <laughs> again it's called a, it's called a rocket mass heater and mm-hmm. uh, it basically creates a thermal mass that moves the heat through and so you can burn this thing for a few hours and it'll heat the house through the night like no kidding we are running out of time but like that's if, cool if, yeah. if, if you want we can I can always you know, it'll take three times, but we can do this again. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm down. I'm down. We should. We. I still have things that I want to get into, and it was, yeah. dude. It was good. Keep uh, catching up, especially the difficulty that it took to organize this for some reason. Uh, but we absolutely, absolutely need to do it again, and we'll probably do it really quick. Uh, just, just stay in chat, uh, Aaron, yeah. communication, and yeah. uh, have fun with your other interview. <laughs> I'd love to do a part two. Actually, it's not an interview. It's a, I've got a on-site vet visit oh like fun veterinary okay like got you yeah 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 well, it's well, expensive to have, have fun with around, it. Yeah. right yeah <laughs> dude thank you for coming on man we will definitely Bye, uh, stay in touch Bye now. all right i hope you enjoyed that episode that conversation with jack from the survival pod uh and like i said this might need to be a two-parter so um this is a perfect opportunity to give any feedback boost on uh, Fountain, which, by the way, on, on Fountain, I've been keeping up with that a lot better. Actually, the website now lets you see the activity under the episodes right on when you click on the episode on Fountain.fm. So it's actually made it a whole lot easier for me to just kind of like make it part of my process and put it in my notes to automatically open up in my workflow the fountain page and just look at the comments and look at the boost. So I am seeing them now guys. And thank you so much. In fact, I'm going to do a little bit of guys take, uh, probably here in the next episode lineup, um, uh, coming up. Uh, and I will go over a lot of those because y'all have got some really great comments and input and I super, super appreciate it. And obviously the sats are, they, they warm my heart at night. So thank you very much for that. Um, and don't forget to check out fountain. If you haven't, the links to, uh, the episode will be, Uh, in or the fountain link will be in the description of this show and of course to the survival podcast who by the way he's a big i mean obviously as you got on the show he's a bitcoiner and also he's been doing fountain and the value for value stuff and everything so definitely boost um you know show him some love over there uh because i mean he's just like i said he's a legend he's been doing this for an incredible i I aspire to 3500 episodes like that's just nuts um, but, uh, uh, anyway, we will have, uh, all the links and details in the show notes, drop me any feedback in the audio notes in the Keat group or, uh, the telegram group or on fountain. That's probably the three dominant ways that if you want to ask a question for Jack, the next time he comes on the show, uh, that is where I will start collecting it. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we will, that'll close it out for today. 
Uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Don't forget to check out Swan Bitcoin. Don't forget to check out CoinKite. Get yourself a cold card hardware wallet. Get yourself a tap signer. Secure your keys. Get it off your phone. Get it off your, your MacBook and buy a smart way. Buy the don't, don't trade. Just, just get it simple. Get it automatic with Swan. It's just easy. It, like, it's, it's not going to be in your way. It's going to be simple. Their app is great. Check them out. Like the simple way to do things is to just buy regularly, don't trade, don't look at charts, and just put it on your hardware wallet. Just just get it into your custody and separate your keys from your devices and you solve 90% of the issue, 95% of the dominant issues and concerns in the Bitcoin space right out the gate. All the details, uh, discount codes, special links, uh, all of it will be right there in the show notes for you to check out. Uh, if you're looking for an easy, safe entry into Bitcoin, You've got it right there in the description of every episode of this uh, podcast. So with that, thank you guys so much for listening. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to share this out with other people you know who wish to survive the banking crisis and the coming monetary shift. And I will catch you on the next episode of Bitcoin Audible. And until then, everybody, take it easy, guys. <laughs>